Perfect. Okay. We'll get started here now. Give a quick pause so that they can edit the recording. Okay. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March meeting of the ABIPSA Boston chapter. My name is Chris Schaffner. I'm one of the volunteer leaders of the Boston uh, chapter. And I'm joined today by uh, Shide Salimi. Uh, and we've invited Al Mitchell from uh, FIAS to uh, tell us about FIAS, uh, Passive House, and especially the uh, energy simulation implications, talking about WUFI modeling. So um, this is a very relevant topic for us here in Massachusetts as the building code has used Passive House as a, um, one of the possible compliance pathways. And with the new stretch code and new opt-in uh, specialized code that is coming into place in the extremely near future, uh, Passive House is gonna be much more prominent in our pathways to code compliance. So we've invited Al. Al is uh, a staff member at FIAS. Uh, he currently works at FIAS in uh, technical capacities, ranging from research to project certification. Uh, most recently, he's been researching thermal resilience and passive survivability modeling. Al holds a degree in architectural engineering and architecture and is in the process of obtaining his PhD from the Illinois Institute of Technology in architectural, architectural engineering. Uh, so Al will present and then we'll have time for some questions. But if you do have any questions, please uh, type them into the chat and uh, we can see them and, and field those questions as we go along. Uh, thanks again for joining and uh, it's all yours, Al. Thanks for the kind introduction, Chris. Um, yeah, so I've got the FIAS 101 uh, slide deck here that we can work through just to go over some of our uh, the core things that come into play when trying to certify a building. And then I've also got a sample Wolfie model and some side calculators that I can go over and respond to some specific questions. But um, we're we're not here to, uh, or uh, at, at FIAS, we, we, we're on your team. We want you to succeed in getting through this process. So we're not scary and we don't bite. So we're always open to questions at any point in time. Um, yeah, so what is FIAS? FIAS, formerly known as the Passive House Institute US. Uh, we're a building rating body and we certify buildings, we certify people. So that's the professionals, the consultants, the raters, the verifiers, and the builders. And then we've also been certifying products. So that's people who, uh, um, so that we can have everyone gets good data that they need for their model from right now windows ventilators and panelized wall systems and then we also have the fias alliance which is our uh, there's some discount rates on any of the consulting that we may need to do in-house and then um it's a great resource for to meet with other like-minded people who are working in the passive building uh sector so uh yeah, it's also the we we try and use the term passive building a lot, not just passive house, because um, it doesn't just have to be houses. These are anything and everything can probably qualify as passive. I know they're in the Massachusetts code. There's that exemption for anything that's about a half CFM of code mandatory ventilation or greater. And that is where the targets do get a little bit tougher, but everything else, offices, schools, residences, gyms, uh, anything within that very typical load range tends to fit well within our current programs. So uh, on the left here, we've got 425 Grand Concourse, which is our tallest passive project I think we've worked on. Some of these are retrofit, some of these are new construction. It's a, it's a good variety of different things. Um, one of the big concepts that I'm sure is not unfamiliar to any of the energy modelers on the call, especially if you've worked through uh, ASHRAE 209, they have that load reduction cycle in there. That's the gist of passive house. We're trying to or passive building. We're trying to put most of the work on the building envelope rather than on the high efficient mechanical systems so that we can reduce those peak loads first. And then we're reducing the, the peak of the curve. We're reducing the area under the curve, hence saving energy on an annual basis. So, um, and there are, of course, those lights, appliances, and domestic hot water loads that we can get around with some smart mechanical systems to make those work our smart controls, but but they sort of exist in a lot of cases as a, as a base load. Um, 
there's a bunch of different benefits that come to it. This is usually we're trying to sell it to someone rather than uh, it being code mandatory, but um, it is focused as well on the indoor environmental quality, thermal comfort from that higher mean radiant temperature from well-insulated building enclosure, um, long-term affordability, keeping that uh, um, keeping those long run utility costs down is important. And then uh, most recently to a lot of the research I've been doing is thermal resilience and what happens when that power grid uh, fails on you or you have a mechanical equipment failure. How does the building float over time, especially during extreme weather? Um, so a little bit of the history on some passive design. The first uh, the passive movement was a Canadian and North, Northern North American movement um, that was started in the uh, wake of the OPEC crisis in the 1970s. And then the um, those first energy targets came around in the late 70s into the 80s as some of the physicists, uh, like uh, William Shercliffe is a big name in there, who started to think about what is, what does this heating load look like? How, how low do we need to go? Um, and then the Germans took that standard and then decided to quantify it and come up with pass-fail targets for Germany. And then that standard got pulled back into the United States by FIAS. And then in the early 2000s, or early 2010s, 2011, 2012, there was a split between PHI, the Passive House Institute, and FIAS. And because uh, we had decided that we needed cost optimized and climate specific passive guidance, because in North America, we have everything from Miami, uh, which is, I think, is it 1A or some some people have said it's 0A, um, all the way up to 8 in Alaska or 8. Uh, we got 7 in, in International Falls, Minnesota. So the, the climate varies a lot more differently rather than that stable Central European climate. So that was, that was the big push um, of the split. Uh, passive building principles. So we've got... Uh, Radiation control through better glazing, your air control. So instead of relying on infiltration, we're moving to, to mechanical ventilation equipment, very typical in multifamily and commercial buildings, but at the time it wasn't as typical in single family. Um, trying to reduce thermal bridging, high performance, continue insulation. Uh, and then we have some prescriptive backstops that for hydrothermal performance of walls to make sure no one ends up in moisture court because that's not fun for anyone. Um, and these are the principles laid out again here. Uh, that continuous insulation, I'm sure many people are familiar with some thermal imaging. Um, it's that blanket that we wrap our buildings in. And these are row homes in New York City. The middle one here is a passive retrofit and that exterior surface temperature is significantly lower. So that insulation is performing much better than the either un or under insulated row homes next to it. Um, this is Aqua Tower here in my hometown of Chicago. It's a giant fin tube radiator that's heating up the area right by the lake there. So the thermal bridges got VE'd out right before construction. So we do like to see thermal breaks on any types of balconies or slab edges. Um, and here's a, again, again, another row of row homes that were then wrapped and retrofitted. And it's quite apparent from that exterior wall temperature of how much lifting that, that thermal envelope can do for you. Um, we got the pushing the ventilation towards mechanical ventilation. Again, already fairly typical in multifamily and a lot of the high performance building that you guys are working on, but it also gives us that uh, control over the indoor air quality, which has become a big topic recently. So we do align with a lot of the indoor air plus requirements in terms of ventilation rates, and then also in terms of the filtration requirements for incoming outdoor air and location of the exhaust and fresh air vents for your uh, mechanical equipment so that you're not recirculating any exhaust air and that you don't have anything like uh, you're pulling in that hot roof air or something like that from a misplaced air intake. Um, yeah, like I said, indoor air plus and the other co-requisite program, and we can, I think there's a slide about that a little bit further here. Um, there's a bunch of other the co-requisite programs that I'm sure many of you are already familiar working with. And the other one that has that requirement is the DOE Zero Energy Ready Homes. Um, air tightness control. So 
uh, for most buildings, you're looking at 0.4 uh, CFM, CFM 75 per square foot. I know the new prescriptive requirement in the Teddies went down to 0.35. Um, I think at 75 pascals, we typically see a little tighter than that, closer to 0 0.2. Our numbers are 0 0.06 CFM 50 for uh, combustible construction and things below five stories in grade, and then 0 0.08 CFM 50 for uh, things taller than that of non-combustible constructions. Um, one of the things that you talk to anyone who's done any passive building, they're all window nuts. And um, we're looking at high performance glazing in your climate of Boston and like Chicago here, 5A, we're most commonly talking about triple pane. Um, it's based on the, um, slide here, go back. Uh, it's based a lot on our comfort and condensation requirements. So that comfort is based on that ASHRAE standard 55 ankle draft uh, comfort. So it's the height of the window that'll drive it. So if you don't have too tall of windows in this climate, you might be able to get away with really good double pane. Um, but one of the key things here is the thermally broken frames that are required for this. And we do uh, have a little bit more detailed inputs than I would typically do um, if I were doing an energy plus model or something like that. So we can go over that in the Wolfy section. Um, minimize mechanical systems. So yes, you uh, when you put a lot of work into the envelope, designing it correctly, air sealing it correctly, insulating it correctly, your loads will go down and therefore your mechanical system sizing will go down. Um, I have a lot of engineers who, uh, engineers that we've been working with, especially who have bought into this a lot and have been able to come up with some very efficient uh, small systems that they're able to install. And the manufacturers have responded as well. Um, we're now able to get some VRF cassettes that are half a ton or uh, 9,000 BTUs an hour rather than previously, we're only able to get them down to about a ton. So the smaller mechanical equipment is catching up to where we need to be for these low load buildings. Um, optimization of these passive measures. So uh, like I had mentioned earlier, it's this climate specific building standard that uh, we care about very strongly here and it's all built on a bunch of cost optimizations that were performed and um, it's a conservation first framework so again you're you're using your passive measures the building envelope to conserve the energy and then you can meet that with the highly efficient mechanical systems um We'll talk a little bit about the target setting method because as a as a modeler myself, I'm always curious about this. And this I read through this report uh, before I started working here to make sure um, there was the scientific integrity that I had expected. So uh, we took the fairly typical passive um, space conditioning targets plus the on-site air tightness uh, plus air tightness requirements that are based on the building's durability and then uh, required that on-site quality assurance to make sure the building actually gets built as designed and commissioned properly. Um, and it's tuned to climate, building size, occupant density, dwelling unit size, and then uh, overall life cycle cost of the building. So uh, this is a graph that if you've ever run BOPT, uh, it might be familiar to you, but there's this point here at the bottom of the curve based on your cost per year and the source energy savings where you cannot put any more money into the building itself, whether mechanical equipment or envelope, where it, it, you're not experiencing diminishing returns. And that's, that's where you are beyond the knee of the curve here. So at this point in time, dollar for dollar, it's better just to invest in renewables than it is to invest further in the building itself. So that's where uh, we came up with an optimized building. And then that building was used to um, determine the targets by a crossover modeling. And climate specific. So like I had mentioned that we've got all these different climate zones within the United States. Uh, we have a bunch of these files and we can create custom files for some locations that are too far, or especially when you get out into the mountains. Um, but readily available for Massachusetts, most of the state is covered with our, uh, our climate data. 
and each of these climate data corresponds to target calculations that'll account for that building size, density, and dwelling units use type. Um, other quality related requirements we expect is this on site quality assurance testing and inspection. So that's where a lot of these prerequisite programs come into play um, with the Zero Energy Ready Homes, Energy Star, Indoor Air Plus, and uh, all of our. Um, a lot of our quality stuff is built on on hers. This is that uh, I had mentioned earlier about the prereq program. This is the uh, the ladder of efficiency, we'll call it. So it's built on top of all of the codes. Everything along the way is an improvement. So where we we see ourselves as that next step beyond the zero energy ready homes requirements um, to FIAS core, which is all of the uh, passive building measurements without needing to hit zero, and then there's via zero, which is our source zero program. Um, I'm sure we all know site versus source energy, but a quick review here. Uh, site energy is what you pay at the utility meter. Source energy is that initial input of the energy at the source uh, of it. So if you're using coal for a power plant, how many BTUs of coal do you have to burn to get to use into your building on site. Um, and then we have a source energy limit that comes with all of our projects. For residential, it's a per person limit based on uh, sort of a fair share of energy use per person from at, at a global scale. And then for our commercial and non-residential, we're looking at limits per square foot. So a very typical EUI target that people might be familiar with. So again, it's that conservation first, and then we'll meet those demands with highly efficient mechanical equipment. And then if you want to take that point, you're already at that, ideally at that cost optimized point where it just makes sense to either add in some kind of community solar or on-site renewables to uh, get yourself to zero. So FIAS core is that middle step that doesn't require the source zero. And then FIAS zero is zero. Um, so yeah, this is that similar path outlined in a different diagram here that it's essentially we, we see this spot here that passive spot as the best path forward to zero take a quick look at the chat if there's any questions okay cool not yet we'll continue on um so yeah it's built on the pyramid first of quality health durability safety uh, from our air tightness, our moisture control requirements, and then those prereq programs. Uh, building on top of that is all the passive conservation strategies. That's from our our uh, space conditioning target demands, which function similarly to Teddy's, but uh, without the prescriptive modeling uh, systems and loads and stuff like that. Um, then we're on to active conservation strategies. So that's any of your high, your mechanical design, your equipment selection. If you're going to try and reduce lighting loads in some of the common areas or something like that, th those are all allowable there. And then either on-site or off-site renewable energy is to that zero target. Um, I don't know if anybody on here does... Uh, single family or duplexes but if you were going to do a duplex or single family and you didn't want to do any modeling we do have a prescriptive path i'll review that fairly quickly this is a modeler call so i, I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot of this um we do have a couple scope limitations on this um but it's built and tuned from that same climate specific optimization to determine uh, where the prescriptive points are and if i'm doing a feasibility study um where I'm doing some kind of modeling to try and hit the passive targets, I might start with those prescriptive guidance, and I'll show you where that lives on the website, and then try and reduce my R values and U values from there to to get the model to sit nice, gently resting on the targets with a little uh, leeway. So um, this is that prescriptive snapshot. It's online. I'll point that out uh, in a little bit here, um, but it just gives a rough idea on required roof ceiling, R value, U value, slab, ceilings, walls, fenestration, window requirements in terms of solar heat gain coefficient. Um, it's, it's just a good starting place. 
Um, so I, quick yeah. Alan, got a quick, quick question here from Gary, yeah. and it's one that I have as well. And sure. That's the idea of applying passive house or fias to uh, non-residential buildings, and how are the EUI limits uh, set for those types of buildings, and what impact does the potentially more complex and variable operating schedules have on those types of buildings in, in this program? Yeah. So um, the EUI for non-residential buildings is set at. Uh, in, in Wolfie, so um, 22 point, 24.5 KBTUs per square foot per year of source energy target. Um, and those come from, uh, like I said, they come from that optimization as well. And uh, in terms of the, the load input for those schedules and internal gains and things like that, um, it's not as complicated as doing an hourly dynamic model. Uh, and I, I can point that out to you uh, in the Woofy section. But also, um, that target's not too hard to meet. The, uh, the other thing about the non-residential target as well is we do have an allowance for process loads. Um, so any type of space you're doing that has some kind of equipment requirement that's beyond normal office or school or uh, that level of equipment, um, but it's required for that space to function as designed, uh, there's an allowance on that source energy target for that. And the analogy that my um, coworker James uses all the time is if you uh, if you need a mechanical bull for your cowboy themed bar, the mechanical bull is a process load. But if you are building a corporate law office and you want a mechanical bull in there, that's not a process load. And then that is a source energy penalty that you'll have to make up for. But I would assume the coffee machine is a process load at the law office then. <laughs> it should be. It should be. And, th and then a quick follow-up uh, that I was curious about as well. Um, I've been told that the site-to-source ratio that VS uses is a little different than the one we might be using for, say, Energy Star. Uh, sure. Can you talk about that a second? Yeah, for all the 2021 models, um, we are using 1.8. Uh, it's still 1.1 for natural gas. Uh, electricity is 1.8 instead of 2.8 is what we used to be. And I think when FIAS 2015 started, it was still 3.16. That's based on the national average, based on um, data out of Cambium, NREL's tool where they came up to model the long range marginal emission rates of all of the power plants in the entire country. So we use, we use 1.8 as the average for that. All right. Does FIAS performance criteria calculator categorize low rise below three stories and mid rise above four stories is rot. So anything that's dwelling units um, where the occupants are there longer than 30 days, so not a hotel or a motel, um, is considered residential for our target calculator. And anything that is where the dwelling, the dwell, the occupants are there less than 30 days, so hotel, motel, and all other building types fall into that non-residential calculator. Okay. Check the other Q&A. Will this event provide CEUs for FIAs? I did not ask for them, but I will give you my email at the end, and I can follow up on that. Um, okay. And all right, let's go forward here and I can come back to some more questions later. Um, so this is actually not right. So uh, the only person who is required in um, the process to certify a building through FIAS is the on-site QA, QC person. So raters are for single family homes and then non-residential and, and raters could also do a small multifamily like a duplex or maybe a, th a triple decker, uh, three flat. Um, verifiers are for anything larger than that and all the non-residential projects. So that on-site QA, QC process, QA, QC person is the only person who's required to be trained through FIAS. Uh, the CPHC and the bill, their help. Um, and that's great. If you want to go through that process, I highly recommend it. Um, 
especially for the for the people on this call, I'm guessing certified passive house consultant is the most appropriate training to take. It's not required, um, but they're the person who's going to go and verify that compliance throughout the design. They're going to respond to all of our comments and feedback in the model and provide us all the documentation for our review. And they're typically also the person driving the energy model. Um, we have a guidebook. It's free on the website. I'll point out where it lives. It's about 200 pages. It's not as dense as the uh, ASHRAE 90.1 to read, but it, uh, it'll go over a lot of all of our certification requirements. And then chapter six is the entire modeling guidelines. Um, and then it's got other appendices with more information and references and things like that. And then we have a handful of other calculators that live outside of Woofy for other analysis that might need to get done. Um, a lot of them are based in Excel. We have a couple that are online, but I can point you out to a couple of them uh, and where to find the ones that you're going to need from the get-go. And then our review process is also very iterative. So if you submit something to us on the first round and we think there's a calculator that you need to analyze a heat pump water heater, or you've got the ERVs outside and you need the calculator for that, we'll point you to the direction of those. Um, we're pretty agnostic as to, uh, as to how you get to passive. Uh, I don't yell at anyone for um, using EPS instead of rock wool or anything like that. But uh, so because of that, and we have a couple of prescriptive backstops, but we're fairly agnostic as to how you get to the source targets. And it's these source targets that are calculated, these source and space conditioning targets that are calculated and will be passive that prove the building is compliant with our standard. And that's a uh, very simple software. It's frustratingly simple to me, at least, where there's some things I just can't get it to do what I want it to do. Um, and then, but in that regard as well, all of the targets are calculated at the bottom. And if you've got all the green check marks, then you're good. It's fairly simplified. Um, we do also have our Psi value calculator. That's another spreadsheet side calculator that uses inputs from um, Therm or if you want to use Flixo or Heat Flux Pro or any of the other thermal bridge analysis software, we'll accept those reports as well. So that's how we'll check for thermal bridging. And then we use Woofy Pro as our um, the 1D hydrothermal modeling tool. Uh, a lot of times we end up doing this in-house for people and it's about uh, two hours of consulting. So it's not too bad, but I will also review other people's uh, Woofy Pro models done per our protocol uh, to allow that for certification. Again, we typically don't need the hydrothermal analysis, but it is an option if uh, you want to stray from the prescriptive ratios and from sheathing to cavity and stuff like that. Uh, talk quick about the certification process. To me, this is one, uh, having gone through a couple other certification um, programs in my time as interns in different engineering firms and architecture firms. Uh, this is actually, I think, one of our, our, our highlights here. And uh, like I had mentioned at the top of the call, um, FIAS is on your side and we want you to succeed uh, through, through this process. So uh, it's broken down into two key steps. The first is design certification, which is this iterative feedback process where we review the model, the drawing set, and then provide feedback line by line in that model and feed you calculators or other resources or anything else that we might need uh, to make that happen. Ideally, you'll do design certification first, then start construction. And then um, upon completion of construction and all the testing is done, then we'll do the final certification process. I understand sometimes the schedule is tight uh, so we'll see models and things that are already built. I don't like to typically see that because it, it can lead to some hairy situations. But um, and also to this, ideally, this design certification process is submitted early to us. Um, probably need design, you know, fifty percent CDs or design development drawings are usually fine as well um, to to get working through that process. Um, we also do offer feasibility studies um, for uh, this as well, where we'll go ahead and have our staff build out pretty much uh, all the geometry in the model and build a fairly basic model based on a narrative our documents provided. 
Um, some people think that it's cheaper to farm out this phase to us even. Uh, it, it's happened before. So, um, And then after that, uh, the first step then is you get a quote for the project. It's based on the size uh, of the project. And then, yeah, this is pre-designed or schematic design. And then you get a contract set up with FIAS. Uh, the second phase of that then is that design review. This is that longest phase that ideally in the construction process, you're working through design development and construction drawings. And this is where we'll review the energy model, the plan set, um, and it's iterative. So most projects will go through three or four rounds of review. I've seen some go to seven or eight. I've also seen some people do a one and done. So those are all options on this phase. Um, and then construction happens, commissioning happens, and then in that post-construction phase before it's occupied is when we start reviewing all of those um, those radar and verifier test documents from the testing and balance and the on-site commissioning and QA, QC. And we're going to go ahead and hit the chat because we're getting it all hit up here. Can I see the question from Vaughn? Yes, I'll get back to that. Yeah, I think... Yeah, that's our only question right now. Is the is the one from Vaughn? Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Yeah, the row home in Boston to be built next to a vacant lot where another one will soon be built. Is the party wall required to have continuous exterior insulation? I can take in consideration this wall is adiabatic in the future. Um, yeah. Uh, this is sort of project timeline specific if it's part of a process where we know that what thing the adjacent building is going to get built then we can consider it adiabatic but if there's no plans for it or it is just a, a truly vacant lot um and there's no plans in the process to go through that process i don't think we i think we might consider that exterior uh, wall but that that's a very project specific question that um i think james would be best to answer So, um, let's keep trucking along here real quick. Uh, certification growth, it's grown on a fairly exponential curve. Congratulations to New York, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania and out here in the Northeast. You guys have the greatest uptake in largest amounts of passive building, certified by us, um, and I think also PHI. And then resource and training, uh, like I said, this guidebook's a great reference for all of the different um, sections and steps and modeling protocol, everything like that. Um, and then we also have built out a new website in the past, I think it's a year and a half or so, um, and we're trying to make everything more accessible. So we have a whole resource library that's searchable. It's got a bunch of check boxes to help filter different things and all of the resources in the resource library are free um you don't have to pay anything extra or be a member or anything like that to get the access to those and i'll point out where those are um and then we've also got a certified project database with all of our certified projects in here that sometimes there's pictures sometimes there's specs and this is also filterable if you're looking for a couple precedent studies just to see what is multifamily and 4a what did they use for their wall insulation what type of windows that they have um, a lot of that data lives in that certified project database um feasibility study turnaround five to ten business days like i said these are the fees here and we can um and we can quote that, but any building up to 100,000 square feet, non-residential is four grand. Uh, so you could figure out how much fee you would have your modelers spend on getting that model together to this point in time. And then we also have a follow-up call where we can do review of findings and, and make some updates in there. So there are some CPHCs um, at some companies where they will just farm this step out to us. Um, we have all of this training here. Uh, like I said, the certified passive house consultant is probably what applies to most people on this call. Um, it's moved to an online format uh, since I had taken it. And then we also do have raters and verifiers for those who are in the QA, QC and testing area. So uh, let me yeah. follow up on that. So let's say I'm a, 
modeler. I'm a BIPSA member on this call tonight, and I've been mm -hmm. running eQuest models for a few years and maybe some Energy Plus, and now I want to learn how to do Woofy modeling. Which of these would I take to do that, or is there something else where you'd send us first? Yeah, so the, the Certified Passive House Consultant, the CPHC, has uh, Woofy modeling built into its curriculum because it is it's meant for passive building 101 and building science all the way through that. We also will offer every once in a while a few Woofy specific trainings that I think are about four or eight hour uh, online trainings where it'll be just, I think we call it like Woofy expert level um, multifamily modeling or single family expert modeling. Um, and then we've also offered those as pre-conference sessions as well, if you wanted to come to the conference. So uh, if you don't want to do the certified passive house consultant thing, that's another path where you can just get the zero to hero in Woofy passive modeling. And what you have to remember too, is a lot of the people who end up taking the CPHC are architects or engineers who typically don't have a whole lot of modeling experience or maybe not a, a super strong building science background. So it, it it does cover a lot. It's a lot of breath in that training because it's got to go zero to hero, but um, it does cover all of those topics. All right. Uh, yeah, here's the Wolfie Passive software training. So we do have a 10 hour beginner one. We have the advanced single family and then that advanced multifamily that's broken. It's eight hours. I think it's broken up into two four hour days. Um, but that will go through basically line by line through what we see in Wolfie modeling and what our protocol and expectations are for those. Uh, there's the Alliance. Like I said, it's got a discount on webinars and conferences. And then we also have monthly office hours, which I think is a great resource for our members. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do on staff because it's just a casual conversation where people will, it's, it's like visiting a TA, right? And you get, bring your questions, we shoot the shit a little bit, and um, we'll go through and figure out what's wrong and do some project specific questions a lot of the time. So that's a, that's a good it's a good resource. Um, let's do any questions on the presentation now, and then I'll move to the uh, just a quick demo of Woofy Passive, if anyone would like to see that. Yeah, I, I think we're very interested in seeing the, the Woofy. Yeah, OK. So maybe just jump into that, and then we'll see what questions come up. Sure. So I went ahead and pulled up um, a feasibility study that we had done for a project um, just to show some of the the basic bits and pieces here. Um, now, please also do note, there's this is Wolfie Passive 3.2. They released a new version that has a couple bug and calculation error fixes 3.3 um, and the eventual um, modeling we are working on developing a new tool based on a lot of this that's going to have some more advanced features and probably also be cloud-based in the future so um but can i can i ask yeah. another basic question yeah how, how do you get the geometry in there okay yeah sure um <laughs> Yeah, no, so there are a couple different ways to do it. There's a free version of Wolfie Passive that doesn't allow geometry import. The paid version does from SketchUp. Um, there is an option in here to try and import a GB XML. I haven't had great success with that one, but um, also if you, I guess the lady bug, yeah, two PH. Uh, Ed May, who's a CPHC out of um, out of New York City, he put together this fantastic uh, ladybug grasshopper. If you're in the that world, to uh, Woofy Passive plugin, um, I'll drop that link in the chat here. Um, that's a that's a good means. The GBXML can work. I've seen a couple people make that work out okay. I haven't had great success with it on my end, but typically we'll just do a, a single surface SketchUp model um, here, and uh, that gets imported from SketchUp. There's a plugin for Wolfie that lets you assign the surfaces via opaque or transparent, and uh, you can just import that. It's a fairly quick process. Um, but we do we do model the building to the extents of the thermal envelope. 
So it's to the edge of the exterior rigid insulation if you've got that, not to the edge of the um, uh, to the edge of the rain screen, or it's not to the edge of the sheathing, and then you ignore the exterior insulation. Um, for larger projects, it doesn't make as big a, of a difference. So we do have a little bit of uh, margin for error there. Um, the geometry, you can also edit geometry in here by playing with these little vertexes and sliding them around. I, I don't recommend that. I just recommend doing the SketchUp. Um, shading elements can be modeled separately as well. So they've got some balconies here and they've got these lollipop trees around here and we've got some adjacent buildings through these surfaces. So it's just like building the geometry for Energy Plus um, to, you know, if you're using Euclid or the Open Studio plugin or if you're using the IES SketchUp plugin, it's not, it's not all too different. Um, and that gets imported into here. Now, one of the few gripes uh, that I really do have with Wolfie as a modeler myself is I can't export this model change the geometry, then re-export it. Every time you re-import, you might have to reassign uh, materials. But we have a trick in our, we have a SketchUp guide in the resource library um, that's got a couple tricks to simplify that process and also to import multiple window types. So I, I'd take a look at that. Um, now, Wolfie Passive is a monthly, uh, month, average monthly temperature steady state modeling tool. It's not a dynamic tool like uh, anything running Energy Plus, Do2, or that IES VE engine. Um, so it does take monthly climate data. We have all of this supplied on our website, um, and it will import right away and plots monthly temperatures. And then we have the source energy CO2 uh, factor here. This is where we did enter the 1.8. Because um, Wolfie Passive 3.2 doesn't support the 2021 standard fully, but you can use it for that. Um, we just have a couple side calculations we have to make, but the new version 3.3 will cover that. Um, here's our building. Uh, a lot of this stuff, like I said, is list enumerated and listed in detail in Chapter 6 of the guidebook. Uh, so you can almost use it like you'd use the um, Appendix G of ASHRAE 90.1 and just follow through step by step of what's what's typical or what's required for each of these different inputs. Um, the air tightness number goes in here. Uh, we've adjusted the mechanical room temperature. This is because the ERVs are outside. Um, in this situation, and we have a little side calculator that'll spit out the average monthly temperature for this climate. So we're in Providence, Rhode Island. The average outdoor temperature for the year is 41, and it'll use that for the ERV. And then um, we have numerical inputs for the foundation interface, uh, similar to using Kiva. Um, so it'll take into account for the perimeter edge, the slab area, um, that type of detail. There is a manual J button on here. I've never used this successfully and I wouldn't try. Uh, do your load calcs elsewhere, please. Um, and here we have specific heat capacity. This is to account for the thermal mass. Again, there's a side calculator to help determine that. Uh, one of the things we are sticklers on here that is a little jarring for first time Wolfie passive modelers is this concept of interior conditioned floor area. Um, that's all of the jip on the inside. Uh, we will see takeoffs and calculations for that. So we'll do takeoffs to determine um, this and, and CPHCs will submit those to us. All of the opaque components in here um, show up in this data tree, which on the side is your key navigation through it. And there's different assignments. So different boundary conditions, in inner air, outer air. So everything in this, oh, one of the other big differences I should point out too, everything in this in our, in this case is a single zone model. If you have a mixed use building, you'll probably have two different cases with two completely different, either two separate models or two different cases. Like we have two cases in here, one for the residential portion, one for the non-res. Um, we can't do target calculations on the multi-zone model, and because it's already a simplified steady state, it's okay to model it as a single zone, believe me. Um, it's one of my earlier things where I'm like, what? Uh, all of our assemblies get modeled in here. Um, these are editable. 
and um, this just has polyiso on it. We don't model exterior rain screens uh, because that film resistance is already accounted for in here, and uh, um, it doesn't need to know that because it, it'll try and account for the R value of the air pocket as well when that air pocket's vented. So typically, we'll see stuff. Uh, if you're talking about a, a wall with exterior rigid, exterior rigid sheathing, uh, whatever the stud layer is, and then JIP on the inside. Um, we have a database of materials on here that we've been working on updating, but these are also customizable. So if we wanted to add, um, for example, we could add a new layer of cellulose insulation to this here, um, and you can adjust that R per inch by clicking here. Um, and then to account for any framing in a wall, instead of looking at the 90.1 Appendix A, we can add these subdivisions here. Um, that's 1.5 new 80. And then we can add in whatever our um, thermal bridge material is in that. So let's say we got spruce studs. Fine. And then click. Make this a little smaller so I can find it. So we can go ahead and just build that framing into the layer and it'll automatically account for that uh, and create that homogenous layer that'll get put back into the model. So um, this is a quick thing on the opaque. Uh, we've got same thing here, above grade walls. And you can also build a database of these uh, different assemblies that are typical in your office. If you're in an architecture firm or you're working with an architecture firm that has a default list of assemblies, and you can export your list of walls and windows as an XML file to share between different users. So everyone's always working off the same database of components. Um, for windows, again, like I said, passive people are window nuts, and um, we have data sheets to support this. This is a feasibility study, so I've got the simplified window input right now, but we will see, we will need to see documentation, whether our verified data sheets, the PHI's verified data sheets, or we have a calculator to back out NFRC data if you have it for windows. Um, there's a glass U value for the center glass, the solar heat gain coefficient, frame width, frame U, and then the psi value for the spacer, and then the psi value of the install. And we have default install conditions if you don't want a therm model and try and figure those out. Um, I'll jump ahead. So thermal bridges get accounted for here from that psi value calculator. Um, it's a perimeter, an attachment, and a length, and then you calculate that psi value from the psi value calculator, or like I said, from Heat Flux Pro or Flixo, or there's a couple other commercially available thermal bridge modeling tools. Um, for residential, our internal loads and occupancy are pretty straightforward here, where you're just entering the appliances, and then these numbers that go into here are all available on Energy Star um, certification data sheets. One of the things I'll point out, though, um, that's probably going to be key for a lot of the projects you all are working on is for multifamily, Woofie can't uh, properly calculate the internal MELs and lighting. So we have one of our many Excel calculators to account for this. This is our multifamily calculator that will calculate total MELs, total lights, and then total exterior lights. And this is where just to take off of dwelling units and how many different types of each of the units goes in here, bedrooms per unit, and it'll go ahead and calculate all that out. And then we have default common areas. This will, uh, for any space in a multifamily, um, we have 99% of them listed here. There's an option to go custom on these as well, but then we typically need lighting plans and some kind of a takeoff to account for the lighting loads. And then we uh, account for elevator um, in this step as well. And this is based on Energy Star. There's a reference elevator calculator. Um, it's the Energy Star multifamily new construction calculator calculation. So this is available on the website. I'm going to get to that too. Uh, Check out the things. 
Uh, uh, we are yeah. we are coming up to the top of the hour, so um, yeah. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a quick quick summary of what's left. I don't think we're going to have a lot of people hanging on past the sure, past the sure, sure. Yeah. But, um, it's, so, so Liam's yeah. asking a question here, and I want to follow up on it too. Um, he's asking about the single zone uh, comment, and then explaining why you want to do a three D model if it's calculated as one zone. Uh, versus just having a simple representation of the building. Um, and, and then a more general question, which is when you get the results out of Woofy, how do those compare to, uh, say, an, uh, an Energy Plus model or uh, to real life? Yeah. So on monitor data, we're typically within, uh, I think it's about 5 to 15% um, on the source and site energy. Um, all of the demands and loads are all calculated. Um, they're mechanical system agnostic, which is part of what they tried to do with the Teddy thing um, to specify the mechanical system and then pull the energy from that coil. So these are already all mechanical system agnostic. Like I said, then the source energy is pretty close to what we see. Um, the single zone modeling is um, its sort of a legacy uh, in my opinion, it's a it's a legacy thing that comes from the um, the old PHPP and the spreadsheet calculation methods of of days past, and uh, we've still seen good results come out of this in terms of where people are actually building the buildings to, like those buildings still perform well um, in in real life, even doing this. The reason, though, for the three D geometry is Woofie does. A uh, does do a dynamic shading calculation. Um, whenever you input those windows, uh, it'll actually generate, I don't know if you can see it here, a little reveal around each of the windows and any of the other context you put into here. So it does do a, a 365 degree shading. And in a lot of passive buildings, because the internal, um, or because the envelope loads and transmission losses are are, are pretty much null. It's the um, solar gains that are fairly, um, it's there. It's fairly sensitive too. So, um, and then running Energy Plus and other similar dynamic models um, for single family, I feel really good about it. Um, having done a lot of crossover modeling between this and Beopt, um, and for multifamily, I haven't really looked at the data so I don't want to speak out of turn um, but I, I do believe we're fairly close and then and then non-residential buildings and then um, I don't know if we have enough data on non-res yet to to really to really verify that because we've got we do have a handful of non-residential products but it's the it's the multifamily and especially that affordable multifamily that's been funded by NYSERDA and mass saves that make up the bread and butter of the projects we see yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're going to get a lot of uh, uh, non-residential buildings from Massachusetts that are trying to figure out how to comply without yeah. meeting the teddies. Yeah, Come, and so, coming your way July first. Yeah, and we are, and I, I will say too, um, like we are, we are talking about putting on a non-residential specific webinar in the next month or two as well um, to update some of the modeling protocol. And I've been working on a bunch of stuff internally in terms of calculating internal gains and things like that for non-residential to simplify that process. So um, it, it is something that we've been actively working on. Um, and then one last thing I'll just point out in Woofy, uh, we've got this vent ventilation patterns for either different pieces of equipment or you can put in a ventilation schedule of different rooms here that'll all tabulate. And then the system input is very simplified um, and it's effectively just taking COPs and accounting for pump energy and um, just system coverages. And that's all, again, like I said, it's it's fairly simplified inputs, which is a little frustrating getting used to doing uh, more detailed mechanical system modeling and other programs. But I have done a little bit of co-simulation as well between Energy Plus and Woofy Passive to try and make sure I get a more complicated mechanical system model correctly. Um and yeah, I think the last question I'll answer out of the thing here, I know I'm at the top of the hour, um, in the row house condition, do we need to show the attached building to our building for shading purposes, uh, especially if it's on the, 
Uh, yes, yeah, all the context geometry should be shown and it could be fairly simplified like this is in an urban environment and the context buildings are just shown as this uh, wall of average height for the adjacent buildings. So and Al, where would somebody go for more information? What would be the next step? Uh, yeah, if they wanted to, to pursue this. Yeah, so our website here, um, I'd start with the resources library and then come down to calculators and protocols. And this is where we have all of our common stuff um, in terms of everything you need to get through our certification process. Like I said, starting with that guidebook is number one. Um, and then for the, yeah, there's the performance criteria calculator to calculate your targets. And then there's a couple other uh, calculators that are fairly common, including the climate data sets. So that's that would be the first place I would start. And then if you need, and like I said, we're always happy to answer questions um, and, and uh, on our website here, um, we have a spot somewhere to contact us, but I will also put my email in the chat if you can email me directly. That sounds great. Okay, thank you so much, um, Al. And just as we close here, I wanna make a couple of announcements about Abipsa and Abipsa Boston. First of all, um, as, as hopefully folks have seen, there is the Abipsa USA Career Fair coming up in April. I like to think that Abipsa USA stole the idea that Boston executed last year. Yeah. Um, and, and so if you are uh, hiring or if you're looking for uh, a new place to work, uh, would be a really great opportunity uh, there. And then um, Abipsa Boston, that's, that's us. We're always looking for new speakers and new topics and also people to help plan. Uh, in the near future, we're planning to do some case studies. So if you've got a building that you wanna show off or a project that you've modeled and you wanna show off your, your modeling, uh, please uh, send it along or send some information along to bipsa.boston at gmail.com. And also if you're just interested in organizing uh, and planning, we typically meet once a month to figure out what's gonna happen next. And we'd love to have you on the calls as well. So uh, again, abipsa.boston at gmail.com. And uh, Al, you put your, your email in the chat as well. Uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me with any modeling questions or concerns, especially. I am uh, always happy to talk about it. All right. And with that, we thank you all very much for your attendance uh, tonight and look forward to seeing you at a future meeting of Bipsa Boston. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Al. It was a very uh, interesting presentation.